All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We are back. Uh, this is What Next Part 2. So if you're coming in, make sure you share. Holler at me in the comments. Let us know where you're uh, chiming in from. But we are live. So I'm going to give you all a few minutes to get in the house. And we're going to get it cracking even now. I'm excited about uh, this panel that we have for you tonight. These gentlemen are absolutely no joke. So make sure you are in the house tonight. Last night was absolutely amazing. We are going to put uh, that particular video. Hey Viv, how are you? We're going to uh, put that video back up for you all to see it, uh, hopefully via YouTube. So you'll be able to see all sessions uh, of all three nights and uh, we will go from there. But without further ado, uh, I want to bring in uh, the panelists. So again, as you're coming in, make sure you share, make sure you holler at us in the comments. Uh, if you know any pastors, musicians, worship leaders, uh, worship team members, please get them on this live. We want to have everybody in the room tonight so we can have a very candid conversation uh, across the board. We are going to give you some great information. Grab pen and paper because I promise uh, this is going to be no joke on tonight. All right. So first up, I'm going to go to uh, my friend, my newest brother uh, in Christ, all the way from Marshall, Texas. We have Pastor Alonzo Berry. What's good, man? How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great, man. It's good to have you here. Excited to be here. Excited to have some good conversation. Yes, sir. Now, I'm going to warn y'all, uh, Pastor Zo, don't play the radio. So uh, if y'all looking for the these and thous and those, you're probably not going to get that tonight. But uh, <laughs> uh, but this is my brother who I love so, so, so very much. Um, I know he's in Texas right now, but I am praying that the Lord migrates him right on back to right. Chicago because we need him here. But I am so happy to have you with us tonight, sir. Hang with me. We'll be right back with you. Yes, sir. All right, next up, uh, I'm going to say it like I'm from. I'm still in Carolina. I know I'm in Chicago now, but we're going to Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina. And we're going to bring in my brother, uh, the Alpheus Anderson. What's up, man? What's up? You know what? I've been in the bubble, so I didn't realize you was in Chicago. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's on me. I, you know, again, I, I'm, I've been booed up. I've been quarantined up. So, so <laughs> I get it. But man, you ain't in Carolina anymore. No, I um July 31st makes two years I've been here in the great city of Chicago. Uh my job moved me here, so this is where we are. Praise the Lord. <laughs> awesome. And um man, glad I'm just glad to be here. Yes, sir. I'm I'm honored to have you with us tonight. Be with you one second. All right, let's go to uh wow, this is a lot. So we're gonna go to Charleston, South Carolina. And then we're going to kind of make our way to Charlotte, North Carolina. Then he migrated all the way of all cities to Oklahoma City. So Oklahoma. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. <laughs> and I got on a Texas hat, so I don't know what's I, going I, on with me. I'm just confused. I don't know how that worked. But we, <laughs> we, happy, we happy to have you tonight. Man, this is yeah. you, uh, the Elijah Devon Goodwin uh, with us tonight, man. This guy... We are, are are so blessed to have him. I have been blessed to watch his journey uh, wow. from musician to youth pastor to Jesus. future theologian. Lord Jesus. <laughs> and whatever else, whatever else we want to add, man, I'm so honored to have you with us tonight, man. I'm so glad to be here, man. I, I appreciate you for choosing me, letting me in on the conversation. All of these, I was telling you earlier. All of these guys on here are guys that I watch from, you know, being young. Alpheus let me play when I was playing three notes on the bass. So, I mean, you know, I, I appreciate all of you. I'm so glad to be here, man. Yes, sir. Be right back with you. Last but not least, um, you know, people in high school say that, you know, everybody has like a high school bully. I didn't really have a high school bully, but I did have a college bully. And my college bully was by the name of John Paul McGee. True story. But some 10 plus years later, uh, we are still rocking. And this this is my guy, will always be my dude. So I am honored to have the Pastor John Paul McGee. Listen, I'm so sorry to every musician that might be on here tonight. I have yet to meet 
anybody that can play an organ like John Paul McGee. I'm I'm so sorry, so sorry. Uh, but I'm glad to have you. What's going on, man? I'm glad to be here. I am just honored that you would invite me to take part in the conversation. Um, love Elijah, love Alpheus, and um, looking forward to uh, making the acquaintance, of course, with a new brother tonight and just uh, being able to help uh, people kind of move forward through this season we're in. So thank you for uh, thinking enough of me to uh, have me be a part of this. This is great. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, everybody. So this is our panel on tonight so we are going to get it cracking uh let me see i always like to try to do an icebreaker so let's let's go uh john paul let's start with you so uh i know pastor in daytona but you live in atlanta georgia so uh atlanta braves or the atlanta falcons which one? Oh, the falcons all the way pastor zo uh cubs or white Sox? <laughs> Well, uh, I'm not really well versed with sports, but I guess since I live on the north side, it would be Cubs. I don't know about that, but okay, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, uh, Devon, let's go with uh, what's the better city, uh, Charleston or Charlotte? Now, you know I'm from Charleston. <laughs> <laughs> Charleston got all the culture. It's definitely, it's most definitely Charleston. I love y'all, Charlotte, but it's Charleston. <laughs> <laughs> and Alpheus, uh, what's the better keyboard, uh, Yamaha or Roland? Uh, Yamaha. My God. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny how that shifted in the past 10 plus years or so, because it used to be Roland. Everybody was rolling down. All right, man, let's get to it. So my first question of the night um make sure uh my first question of the night let's see i'm, I'm gonna try to give a, a light one let's start light pastor jp what is the responsibility of the levi in this season wow um let me address the question just by starting to uh, off by saying that if if you are a Levite and you attach your assignment to a season, then that's a problem. Uh, the responsibility of a Levite is always to be the one who uh, offers sacrifice uh, to God on behalf of God's people. So whether that is the intercessory prayer arm, the uh, the musical arm, the preaching arm, um, if this season has shifted you in any way out of your place, then you need to ask yourself, are you a Levi truly? Or what do I need to do to be able to adapt to the season? Because this season requires uh, the, I would say, the intensified engagement of those who walk and uh, exist in a Levitical way, shall we say. Yeah, absolutely. Pastor Zoe, same question. Uh, first of all, I think it's a great question. And uh, make sure I get all y'all brothers' information so we can stay in contact. Um, <laughs> to answer the question, it is, uh, number one, you have to understand what responsibility is. Okay. Responsibility in itself is a um, reaction to a prompting, whether it's verbally or whether it's societal there is always a response and you respond with your ability in etymological terms. When it relates to the Levite specifically, the Levitical priesthood was responsible for bearing the articles of the temple, but because their tribe was so large, they all had to be prepared for when their time in the rotation came to be, then they were consecrated enough to do it and do it effectively. So with that being said, um, the Levites of the Old Testament would have been privileged if they were able to do the sacraments two times in their life. But the fact is they had to be prepared. And so right now the responsibility, like never before, is that the Levites should be in preparation for when their time to minister the sacrament and to touch the articles of God uh, comes uh, to be whenever that is. That's my answer to that. <laughs> Love it. All right, bro. All right, uh, Alpheus, next question. Um, 
once the church doors open and are free to open, let's put it out like that. Are we willing to go back to the status quo or should there be a strong overhaul in our approach to the corporate worship? Ask that question one more time. Once the church doors open or, or when they're free to open, are we willing to go back to the status quo so church is normal or should there be a total overhaul uh, in the way we approach corporate worship? I mean, I, I think this pandemic has revealed what should stay and, and what should go. Um, of course, my lens, I'm, I'm really strong. I heavily lean towards youth ministry. So I'm just going to kind of spin it. And I think when we go back, you know, definitely we should um, give a lot more attention to, to youth ministry. Obviously, the gathering, the safety aspect of all of this, it is it's going to be different. Um, but I, I'm really concerned in, in the pandemic. If you had a weak youth ministry before the pandemic, it's almost non-existence in the pandemic. And so when we go now, this is a great opportunity for, I think, digital outreach. Yep. We ain't knocking on apartments in, in the pandemic. We're knocking on Instagram. Right, and we right. can really, really uh, build a, a nice, something nice during this pandemic um, virtually. And when we go back, I think that's something that we definitely, if we have not considered uh, some sort of a digital or virtual um, uh, situation for our churches, Absolutely. Uh, uh, Pastor Hannah said something that was that was key. He said, if you're not using your youth during this time, then something is wrong. Uh, he's like, because that's your first resource of all things social media, oh, yeah. all things technology, all things digital media. So this is the time to train them up, as we often say, to be the church that you need them to be or get you ready for in the next five years. So why wait until that time comes? Meet the need right now. Uh, Devon, same question to you. Um, uh, can you ask me a question one more time? I was going to jump in right where we, we all, where we were, but if you ask me one more time. So, so when the church door is open, should we go back to the status quo or should there be a total overhaul in the way we do corporate worship? I'm going to be very careful because I, as, all, as we all do have the same call to obedience, I feel like our assignments vary, especially uh, church to church, assignment to assignment. But I will say that I believe that this pandemic quarantine more uh, particularly has really uh, should have been a, a rebuilding stage for everybody. I think that we all should have been rebuilding and at least recalculating, um, recalibrating, just trying to see, um, like Alfie said, what works and what doesn't. The reality is there's some things that just don't work no more. And it might even be our preference, you know? Um, and if we are uh, so in love with the last season, then we'll probably bring back things into this next one that we don't need. And I mean, the reality is we just don't need it. Even as it pertains to youth, I feel like uh, we are the ones, I'm 29, I'm young, you know, I'm probably the young buck, <laughs> but uh, we are uh, the ones who are a little bit more internet savvy and all of those things. But I think it has transcended through generations that if you don't have youth at your church, if you don't have young adults at your church, you literally prophesy the demise of the ministry. Like it, like it, it might not, it might not be happening now. You might not die, but you will perish. You will decay over time. Um, and so I think that if you are not uh, moving your ministry and coming out of preference and moving it to what, first of all, what God has ordained, what he really wants right now, not just what he said, but what he's saying. Um, and then also just to kind of get in the context of our youth and, and who's next, then we won't have a what's next. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Devon, let's let's keep it with you for one second. All right, so now we're about to get to the nitty gritty. So buckle your seatbelt because it's about to be a bumpy ride. All oh, right. Lord. First question. Musicians at large have been deeply affected by this COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. What are some ways to keep the gigging musician in demand or should the musician now seek other employment? My God, Prophet Downey, you trying to start trouble. <laughs> you know we, we got senior pastors and stuff on here. I'm just a youth pastor. I don't want to get in no trouble. I'm just playing. Um, first of all, I believe many of my brothers, all of my family, I appreciate everybody. I'm watching everybody, especially the ones that are my age now. Um, we have to find streams of income. We cannot, we can no longer use 
being a full-time musician as a past to really still be a part-time one. You say that you are a full-time musician, but you literally play when it's time to play. In, in the, the remainder of the day, you watch a Netflix, you get up at 1.37 p.m. You know, like you, you your, your whole day is gone. You have no other streams. You're just doing church. Um, that is just something that just cannot happen um, no longer. And I just don't believe that you're creative enough to write songs, play keyboards, and you don't have any kind of business aspects to you. You don't have any kind of other things that are gestating and um, and, and moving in you. That you're gonna have to find a way to pull those things up. And I think that we've been thrown into uncomfortability, but we are now having to search ourselves and find out what else do we do. Now, in my in my case, I'm still a musician. I still play, um, and so I, I'm under my bishop, Bishop Joel Tubman. And so in my case. Um, I have some amazing leaders who have made it to where I don't have to worry about these things. Um, but that's not everybody's case. And even in my position where I am good, I'm still searching myself to find out what can I do. I don't think that it's asinine to have a job and, and be a musician. I don't think there's nothing's wrong with that. And, um, I don't think I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think more importantly, um, depending on what you make at church, and we all know how that is sometimes. Uh, you can't get married. You can't have a family. You can't have a follow You can't do anything. You know, you're going to have to grow up and find out what else God has for you. Um, I'm going to shut up now. Anybody else? I, I, I'll jump in by just testifying because uh, I'm normally a week, uh, a week ago, I would be traditionally in a city with Pastor, Pastor John Paul McGee. And obviously that comes, that's on the road money. And um, I mean, I don't care how you, how you, <laughs> you say it is on the road money and it is either a car payment, it's a house payment or it's play money. Amen. Right. <laughs> and so obviously June, July, it's, I, I'm being a little transparent here is my biggest, my biggest uh, income for the year. Praise the Lord. But what has blessed me this season as a musician, as a teacher, as a thought leader is, um, let me say it this way. A friend of mine, Philip Carter says, "Even you may, you, you may have never heard of me, doesn't mean I have never been heard, something like that. Yeah. My point is I have a tribe that, a small tribe that I, that I have in a place, I have an email list. And so in this season, I have been, been serving my email list with digital products and 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 i take them through this process and and what has come from that is is digital money <laughs> and, it, and and that has been a blessing it's been recurring income you know these four months and it's all because i had an email list and and they i call them my tribe and they want something from me and the exchange is a payment and so this could be a blessing to many musicians in this season to package your knowledge, your your expertise. I'm, I'm not talking about just piano lessons virtually. I'm talking about really the, a course. You know, launching a course. Uh, Pastor John Paul is is an author. If you if you can write a book, turn that book into a course. And your book is twenty dollars. Your course is two hundred dollars. Your master class. I mean, so that's kind of what I'm talking about here for musicians. We are sitting on so much money. I'm telling you. And um, Miles Monroe said, the richest place on earth is the grave. Don't die with all that money in you. Yes, you can play a major Sabbath, but man, launch a course and tell us how you do that. And you don't need a big tribe to eat well. I am a witness. Wow. Wow. Pastor JP, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. You, you know I love this subject. You know, and, and I want to, I, I, I want to offer a two-pronged answer to that because um, you, the first question you asked was about the responsibility of a Levite in, in, this, in this season. And it's very interesting that um, there have been many people who claim to be Levites who have lived with the perks and the accoutrements oh. of being a Levite. And now that has been snatched from them, and they're blaming the institution of the church for their lack of income because they were never approaching this from a Levitical standpoint in the first place. It's almost like 
when they put the ark on the back of the beast instead of carrying it with the handles. When you carry it with the handles, you feel the weight, right? And so there are a lot of persons in this Levitical space that were not bearing the weight of a Levite, but they were enjoying the fact that they could build their empire and their entire lifestyle on the back of the church without having to submit to any uh. true level of accountability and responsibility. And now they're bearing the consequence of, the, of that missing. Because uh, when you understand a call to an office, not to a task, but when you understand a call to an office or to an assignment, you understand that there'll be seasons of lack, there'll be seasons of plenty. But when you're sold out to the call, you trust God to be the one who supplies the need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And, and so what I've realized is that we have a lot of persons who have been spoiled by the institution of the church and have gotten away with for many years the absence of an integral and responsible work ethic. And all they've got to do is learn a couple of songs for church on Sunday morning. They can sleep all day smoke weed all night, come to church the next day, and everything be okay. And so now there is no church. And so people are in this disruptive, disjointed, uneasy, anxious space trying to figure out what in the heck am I going to do with myself in, 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 in this space? And so as Althea said, this is the back, back side of it, is that when you live according to a call, then chaos becomes the construct for your, the birthing of your creativity. Wow. As opposed to it becoming the space that leads to calamity. And so now when God disrupts the norm or the status quo as you identified it, as a Levite, as a musician, as someone who is called to this for a lifetime, I now have to dig within and say, all right, what's in here? Because everything in here for me to be a millionaire, not to just make fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, but everything that's needed for me to be the millionaire, so that I could still be faithful to my church and turn the check back into them because I don't even need it. It's already in me. Right. But we, we we're waiting so much to for to be given a deposit hmm. and 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 to be invited on a platform that we don't realize that perhaps we ourselves are the stage. Wow. And so now I'm in a space where I'm realizing, okay, I'm missing Augusta, Georgia this month with, with uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm missing the, I'm missing the rest of the year of my engagement. And so now I had to realize, so now I had to realize, okay, it's not about my engagement. It's about my engaging who I am so that even when we get back to normal, I can be discerning about what I accept. Mm. I don't have to go because I want the money. Because when I'm asleep, my money is working and talking with me. Come on, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fast as oh, before we jump off the foot. Uh listen, I is there are very few things I could say that really um would be outside of what these gentlemen have said. I just want to put the candle on top of the cake of this one. Excellent question. Um, the responsibility that a Levite has coincides with um, being a problem solver. And so I'm of the belief system that uh, when the church doors close, the problems did not end. And so one of the main reasons why the Levitical priesthood existed was not out of uh, something good. It, about, it was out of the need for the entire house of Israel needing someone to be in proxy to go um between them and 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 take their sin and they that they would be absolved and atoned and so if we as musicians are claiming the title levite now um our responsibility to be problem solvers does not stop and so your income comes and your value is dictated in every field based upon the problems that you can solve and so with that being said, there are plenty of things that we as musicians can do 
and, and, and everybody else who, who bears the articles of God in the temple, there are plenty of things that we can do to resolve issues, mm. um, whether it's on an individual level or for the an institution. So that's why we talked about courses. We talked about books. Many of us um, have intellectual property that we're sitting on. I'm guilty of that. And a lot of times people get frustrated when they uh, see everybody doing the same thing. They get frustrated when everybody's releasing a book, everybody's releasing a course, all of this stuff. Um, and they feel like the, the market has become saturated when the truth of the matter is they've only exposed themselves to other producers and not enough consumers. Okay. No. And so the 5,000 friends that you have on Facebook are all producers and not consumers. But when I go into the grocery store and I see a hundred different brands of bread, all doing the same thing, every one of them got yeast, every one of them got, had to go in the oven, but there's a hundred different brands, which represent a hundred different companies, a hundred different CEOs, all who are making millions of dollars of doing something simple, like putting a recipe together, making bread. And so in every industry and church itself in, in an industrial aspect, every industry, the value of a musician or whoever is based upon the amount of problems that you can solve. So the, the thing about it is we have to stop catering so much to other producers and cater now to consumers. And, and I want to add something to that because the, the, what really just hit me in hearing you saying that is that many of us have localized gifts that are supposed to be globalized hmm. right and oh, really? somebody else needs you somebody else needs you beyond this myopic exposure even that you may have and right. we've got to start thinking about what the world needs from us you use the term intellectual property and a lot of times as musicians we reduce our worth to mm -hmm. what our fingers can execute when the reality is is that we've got a brain too mm -hmm. I, I gotta say something i gotta yes. say something. because I, I love the conversation about the consumers and producers and only because i really feel like and, and this is speaking i'm from south carolina i used to live in tallahassee i lived in charlotte i lived in charleston but essentially th those are the people that i know and so all of my life, as I've watched most of you all, you know, I, all of my life, I wanted to grow and be able to present back or even um, just hear a, I'm proud of you from the ones who I've watched, you know, um, and I won't even just go into naming. But because of that, it kind of uh, festers an insecurity to ignore who God has ordained you to, the audience God has ordained you to, and run after the ones already producing. And so, like, even as it pertains to the grocery store, I can almost, like, envision somebody walking into the grocery store and ignoring all of those different people who are, and I know you wasn't talking about that, you were talking about the bread, but I was just talking about the consumers in the grocery store, the people that you don't know, the ones that can't give you the clap hands and the fire emojis, the ones that might not dance like you or sing, sing as well as the ones you admire, and you ignore all of them to go to the other ones that are already producing. And I, I feel like there is a level of insecurity that has to be cured and confronted and dealt with in us that will cause us to turn away from who we trying to impress, turn away from who we trying to uh, battle and compete with and find our audience. I'm in Oklahoma City. I never even been to Oklahoma City, you know, before I got here. But I believe, I just truly believe this is just me, that what I'm able to do here, I probably wouldn't have had the grace to do back home, you know, and, and or especially in this season, because there is a there is a people that I was called to that I couldn't impress. <laughs> you know, I just had to say. Yes, sir. I, I y'all know I usually give a story. So here go my my thirty second story. Uh, uh, I think Pastor Zoe, especially Pastor John Paul, knows about this. Um, I am in Chicago working a nine to five, if you want to call it that. I have a career that has absolutely nothing to do with church, literally. And I will venture to say that I seen God in a way through my career. I believe it that I could have never seen had I tied myself to the four walls of church. And that is not to say that I don't miss uh, being in, in worship full time or being a minister of music or worship leader full time. 
there are times that I do, but I also understand that he's the God of both Maurice and Maurice's assignment. And so if you just limit God to being the God of your gift, then you are just as bad as probably somebody that don't even know him because you're limiting him to something that is much uh, uh, limited, limiting him to 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 a, a box and a method that he wants to get you out of. I listen when I interviewed for my job, I had never been to Chicago. Literally, my my first time in Chicago is when I came to interview. And to be honest with you all, I didn't get the job at first. They yeah. came back and called me and said, hey, this happened, that happened. We want, what is it going to take to get you here? We want you here. Sometimes your name is in a conversation that you're not even prepared for. Yeah. And what, you know, I often say all the time, God can change your life with one decision. Your only job is to be prepared for whatever that decision is. And so like all of these gentlemen have said, like, get out of this thinking. And again, hear my heart. I am not knocking the church, but get out of the mode that uh, of thinking that your your audience or your consumers are only the people that are dancing to your 150 beats per minute drum track. <laughs> That's slow. <laughs> That's very slow, right? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all from the That's, East. Whole, That's, That's perfect, That's perfect for me. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to You got to get out of this mode of thinking that that, you know, uh, everything is going to be funneled through the church because it's, it's it's just not. It's just not. All right. Uh, we're going to we're going to stay on the musicians just a little while longer. And I know y'all mad. But let me give this this question uh, in real quick. It says, were Levites the only musicians in biblical times? I believe churches don't always use Levites, but musicians. Now, the flip part of that, the second half of that question is very loaded. But uh, anybody want to want to tackle this one? Yeah, I tackle. I, 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 go ahead, Pastor. Uh, David wasn't a Levite, but he was surely a musician. And so, when you look at those type of biblical examples, music as a trade was a little bit different from the Levitical office. The Levitical practice, most of the time, may have had nothing to do with music itself. It, 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 it is a priestly vocation. Yeah. But we do see examples like David who are, uh, first of all, the church didn't exist in the, New, in, in the Old Testament. It was uh, the, the closest thing we have to the church is we have the temple, which there was no discussion, no conversation, no shouting, no dancing in the temple. Uh, the temple was for atonement and for cleansing, right? And for sacrifice. So the church in the uh, New Testament, of course, is a completely different thing than the ecclesia, the ek, which is uh, out called in, in, the, uh, in the tent of meeting where you had Moses who had Joshua blow the horn and bring all of Israel to the tent of meeting. It was there uh, that we see the closest thing to church in the Old Testament. But we do see examples of people who were vocationally musicians who were not a part of the tribe of Levi. Absolutely. JP. Yeah, he basically, uh, Pastor just basically said what I was, what I was going to say. And I think that one of the dangers, and I had this conversation a couple weeks ago on another live, one of the dangers of this uh, excessive use of Levite is that its definition is reduced uh, to an expression sure. or one particular essence of the entire role you know because even when you look at the any tribe there were also divisions so you had certain divisions within the tribe that you know you had certain ones that all they did was cleanse the articles in the temple you had the other ones that they prepared the animals for sacrifice then you had the musicians then you had the choir directors and all of these were in the levitical order uh, mm -hmm. but they all had different roles and so I think that at times we do ourselves a disservice by trying to, uh, shall I say, metaphorically expand the language. And in, in so doing, we interpret the depth of what it truly is. There is nothing wrong with being a musician, you know, <laughs> you know, and that doesn't make you less anointed than someone who would say, you know, they're a Levite. You know, we get in church and we start making all these dumb divisions. It's not a rank. <laughs> right, it's not a rank. 
<laughs> I love yeah. South Korean drum. We, I'm gonna try my best to jump off the musicians because I, I know I could I could feel some steam coming out of y'all ears. But uh, <laughs> but this is all good stuff. Before we turn this tide, this question: How do we prepare the breach between musician and pastor, especially when many of them were let go or furloughed without any warning or prior knowledge? How do we keep the soul of the musician intact? <laughs> Can I can I talk about this one right quick? Go ahead. First of all, you had a warning. It was called Fox News. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and number two, if the yeah. news didn't warn you, it's your fault if you were if you're if you're equating your job to the place you get fed. And so uh, we're going to deal with the soul. Are you, you can't talk to me on the level of an employee and then want to act like a sheep when you want me to have mercy on you. If we're going to act like this is an industry, then we don't have the responsibility to make sure your family's fed. We have the responsibility to make sure that our agreed upon uh, contractual wages, all of those things are met. And if we can't do it, then there comes layoffs. We only want to be, we only want to bring soul into it. And I feel, I feel my help here. You <laughs> only want to bring soul into it and act like a sheep when you want mercy and pity. But you are not submitted when you act like an employee. You're not submitted as a sheep. And so to, to, to romanticize the idea of old pastors letting musicians go without warning, you had a warning. It was the news. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anybody else? Anybody? You know, I, I'll take a stab at this. Um, you know, having spent so many years and still um, as a career musician, I understand um, the difficulty of being um, in between jobs. You know, for those of us who are itinerant. Yeah. and who are on the road, we are also in a way unemployed, you know, <laughs> with without warning in January. Because if you build your budget for what you're going to do, have during the year, and then you get to March and April through December is canceled, that, <laughs> you know, that does something to you, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but the reality of the matter is this, is that um, there have been some pastors, and, and, and let me be fair, there have been some pastors who have mishandled their staff sure. in this space. And on behalf of those pastors, as, as, as one, even though I'm new to the game four years in, I want to apologize to any staff member that works within the context of a church, particularly musicians, who have been mishandled by poor human resource practices. Right. Because as a business, we do have a responsibility to make sure that we uh, in with us with a level of integrity and righteousness um, run a, a business that's above board. However, if there is no work for you to do, the expectation for an organization to pay you because of the struggle you will inherit because of the lack of work for you to do mm -hmm. is not the responsibility of the organization. And, and let's just say this, if you would watch the news and if you would read the internet, you would realize that it probably is better for your church to let you go. And here is why, at least up to this point, some of you would have been on unemployment and got a raise. Because unemployment would have paid you more than the two hundred and seventy-five dollars you pay at your church. The one hundred and seventy-five dollars <laughs> church ain't, ain't doing you right. Now you could have been on unemployment, and you know banking way more. But again, it is this. It is this spoiled and very, um, shall I say, um, misplaced responsibility complex that it is the responsibility 
of the organization or the institution to take care of you. No, 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 no. When, when you sign the dotted line, you sign the dotted line here as an employee or as an independent contractor, mm -hmm. right? And most of the states that we are in are at will. So the All truth right. be told is we can let you go and you can quit without explanation or warning. This does not take away the difficulty of the season for us all. But most times, all of us, all five of us, have been on the opposite side, right? Before, mm -hmm. before we developed other careers. And so, you know, all we really pay attention to is the 15th and the 30th. We're not paying attention to the fact that, hell, everybody's church is a storefront. <laughs> right now, right. Down. All, you know, all of us have been put in this space and we all trying to figure this thing figure it up. out. Sure. And so there's a level of this extension of reciprocity and grace that we all need to have yeah. for each other. And if you were working at a church that you know good and well, if they shut their doors, two or three weeks that it was going to set you in a in a space of unemployment. You knew that before the pandemic came. <laughs> but you were deciding to work there anyway. So, you know, perhaps you do need to start filling out applications and deciding what other things you can do. Well, go back to school. Yeah. Live off your student Fly home. Guitar home. Center. And, and, and you know, <laughs> figure it out. Wait, man, I'll, I'll let you go next. I'll go, I'll go last. Go ahead. I'm the young brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, let's let's. I'm gonna deal with the 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 breach between musician and pastor. I think we're speaking more so like to the relationship, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And so I think long gone are the days where musicians, Christian musicians. If you're not a Christian, that's on you. You know, I welcome you to join. You join us. Jesus is wonderful. But if you're not a Christian, you know that's on you. But if you are a Christian musician, long gone are the days where you decide that you are not going to find a leader, a mentor, a father, and you're just going to work at church. Like you, like I, I get, I, there's been times that I've worked at other churches, but I served Brian D. Moore with my life. And so if Brian D. Moore didn't pay me a dime, I'm going to serve, I'm going to be at the Brian D. Moore's church. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. And I'm going to be there. As he tell me to go left, right, upside down, whatever. And I'm doing the same because that's, that's how I was raised by him with Bishop Joel Tubman. And so there might be places that I work, there might be places that I play, and I have a business relationship with them. But essentially, there's always going to be somewhere where I am getting fed. And we have like tricked ourselves into believing that we can run after money in just business relationships. First of all, not even being educated on how to eat sign a contract, prepare one, find out what you need to be doing and, and what stipulations you need to have. But we just, we go into these business ideas and we go into these business relationships and we go after these large lump sums of money and we forget that it's not um, finances that sustains us over a favor. And I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta figure that out, how I really wanna say that. But when I choose a church now, I'm not just looking for finances, but I'm looking right. for the place where I have favor. Mm -hmm. The place where I have favor and and we we have like and I've, I've been around the conversations I'm young so I just came out of this mindset but we literally go for the money and I mean that's as simple as I can put it um but that that's what we do we we leave the churches where we're being fed for more money we leave the places where God has ordained for us to be for more money and we leave and we're uncovered and then when everybody's uncovered then we are in the positions that we're in now you know and I there there just has to be um, some kind of, and I even want to talk about the breach too with the relationship. Because even if there is a situation where you're lose, where you did lose money, or you feel some type of way about your pastor, um, the breach in the relationship, especially if they're your father or your leader for real, for real, that that just shouldn't be. There is nothing that my leader can do to me to to, and, and I'm and I know this is hard because we got people who had good leaders in the Bible. You got you know Eli, Elisha had Elijah. You got you know other people who had great leaders, disciples had Jesus. But David had Saul. You know what I mean? And when and when it comes to submission, my my 
posture and submission has nothing to do with your actions. But if I believe that you are the one that I serve, regardless of what happened in the pandemic, I'm going to be there after the pandemic, before the pandemic, during, during the pandemic. Um, there just should be no breach in relationship. Um, and that might be tough to swallow, but it's the truth. And then the other thing that I wanted to deal with is um, there are ways and there are musicians who have uh, maybe not made the best business decisions and have lost um, money in this in this pandemic, lost finances, lost income in the, during the pandemic, but have used the preparation that they've done in production and other things to now go to their pastors and have something else to offer. Because the one of the things that we said earlier was there's nothing to do. But if your pastor doesn't have uh, a social media presence and your pastor doesn't know what to do with getting on live and and in the aesthetics and how to make this a grand uh, how to how to make this a more presentable or palatable thing that we have going on here here's the time where the musician the producer can jump in with this computer can jump in with the cameras can jump in with the box lights and at least provide something else you know um there are there are so many musicians that are thriving right now because they're working for 10 11 12 churches and they're doing all of their uh, live experiences because the musician that actually worked at that church only knew how to play the keyboard mm -hmm. and so yeah that's all i wanted to say I, I i i'm glad you made that point um it's somewhere on pastor hannah's page go find it but there was a conversation between him and anthony brown Anthony Brown specifically said, I am on payroll as the assistant minister of music of First Baptist Church, Glen Arden. He said, but when the pandemic happened, I saw the quality of what we were presenting online as poor. Mm -hmm. So I removed myself from assistant minister of music and I made it my responsibility to be the production manager for every single exactly. service of every single week so now because you just because you don't see me in front of the camera i am behind the camera making sure that that graphic looks well that that yep. song selection fits what pastor is saying that we got the announcements that look spotless that people know that okay next week we're going to have a zoom call for this our new members know where to go and it's not just thrown together he said i literally from sunday to sunday when the lights go off for the first service i'm already at the next week so again, make sure you have something to present other than just one thing. Like there's there's different avenues. And, and let me add to that because you know I I started with Anthony. I played for Anthony for years. Um, I played for Anthony's father's church when Anthony was the, the minister of music at his wow. dad's church. And so I've seen the right. servant's heart, and the servant's heart follows you wherever you go. The issue here is that both pastors, churches, and musicians have fostered the, the hireling mentality. Mm -hmm. We've hyper-spiritualized it yeah. to make it seem like it's not that. Right. When that's the reality, and then we get into these spaces, like you said, where people start talking about their soul was wounded. No, your soul's not wounded, you're just scared. Yep. Because if the if if an employment crisis gets you to the place of a soul wound, then I gotta ask where is your discipleship in the church? But at the end of the day, there are many there are many musicians sitting in churches from week to week that are not being pastored. So when it comes time man. to when it comes time for the word. That's your bathroom, your 30 minute bathroom break. Right. And then when you hear me about to go to Hoopville, then you want to run in. But but you're not concerned about, about being pastored, about receiving a poor, about being corrected and developed. But then when it's convenient, you want to say, well, you're supposed to be my pastor. And so me having been a musician, and a member of a church and now a pastor. And I was gonna say, well, if I'm supposed to be your pastor, then you a piss poor member. Because <laughs> the rest of the ones that ain't getting paid, at least they sit and listen to me, even if it ain't that good that I got to say to that. That's you right. But, but it's this, it, and somebody just put it, servants serve. And so, you know, I told one of my students yesterday, I said, you know, this is a, this is a space in life where you find a way. And if 
if you can walk away, I told him yesterday, I said, if you can walk away from this, walk away. But if you're just dealing with stress, frustration, and anxiety, confusion, and dismay, then you need to pray through that, work through that, and find a way. And I think that that's really where we all are. Find a way. Find, find a way. niche. Read yeah. a way. Figure yeah. out how to do something. If, if all you have been doing is playing, I don't want to throw shade on that. You, you're great. But now that th there's a new season coming, you need to pick up a book and develop a new skill and hurry up sure. and develop it and say, Lord, breathe on this thing so it can bring me some money. YouTube. YouTube, Reverend. And never yes. be put in this position again. And never, never be put in this position. Never. Never. I, I think never. essentially, and I'm sure that there's been horror stories. I haven't really heard them, but I don't want to demean anyone's experience. I'm sure there's been hard horror, horror stories. But I think as it relates to the relationship that we've been, and I'm talking about musicians, that we have um, created with our pastors, I feel like the dishonorable have just been dishonored. That's that, that's ultimately what's, what's happened. The ones who have not been honorable, the ones who have not been in the seat, as a, uh, of the, in the seat or the posture of a son, you have just seen what it looks like to, to just be a Holland, to just be a musician, to just be a businessman. You've seen it, especially if you don't do business well. Yeah, yeah, man. This is this is good, y'all. Yes. Like, we, yes. We're trying to. We're trying to. I'm gonna try to kick it into overdrive. All right. So we're gonna leave the musicians alone for a little while, a very little while. All right. <laughs> Moving on to the church at large. Alpheus, this question is for you. There has been much talk about the CCM versus gospel genres as it relates to both its relevance and its roots. All right. While we applaud the CCM movement, there are some who feel that it's uh, that its addition to our worship experience with regard and respect should also recognize to a regard and respect for our experience. Is it possible to sing to the Lord and remain racist? Jesus. Hmm. My goodness. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, racism I, I, I definitely is it's, it's wrapped in fear. And, and I always teach my students that fear is an illusion. And um, uh, that was a long question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, but with the CCM and embracing it at and this is funny because tomorrow I have a, a writing session with a white brother in my city. And uh, who I went to college with, and 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 that's a whole nother thing. So, but but the goal is for us to leave this writing session, um, and even in this writing session, I'm, he's probably not on this. That, that I am, we're both fighting for for equity in this intellectual property that's about to happen. All right, he's going to bring what he brings, and I'm going to bring what I bring. All right, and so I'm I'm going to unapologetically bring what I bring. Amen. And he's going to bring what he brings, if, if that makes sense. Now, it's what he bringing. Um, um, does it have biases? And, and you know, if I'm bringing what I'm bringing and it, it's because of my upbringing. Can you sing to the Lord a new song and be racist? Absolutely. All right. And um, because I believe when you were wet cement, you were a kid. Um, it was taught. You were taught that. And and when wet cement hardens, it becomes concrete. And you are an adult. And that thing takes some deconstruction, even in your worshiping God. That's why that's why the Bible says, don't trust your heart. It is wicked and deceitful. <laughs> so you say, I'm saying it from my heart. But but whatsoever man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so um, that may have. Fell ADD ish, and I am ADD. I'm anointed, dangerous, and disciplined. My God. Ah. But y'all take God. That, take and do and oh. do what you want with that. Pastor No, can you sing to the Lord and be a racist? I can. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 Let me be clear on something, okay? Uh racism is a construct that exists in most of 
the uh, countries that were conquered by European nations. The hymn book we open and read are influenced by people or written uh, primarily by people who come from European backgrounds and who in, in many cases might have been on the Mayflower headed this way. So with that being said, I think that it's really idealistic and, and naive to assume that you can't sing to the Lord and be racist. Now, let me, let me, let me say this. I'm one of the people, one of the artists in the United States who gets the chance to go to Europe and gets the chance to teach workshops, so on and so forth, in, in Scandinavian countries primarily. And what they want is black culture, black church, black music. So even white Europeans have a question as to where CCM fits huh. in worship. I'll say this, because I don't want to be long with this, but I but you ask me. <laughs> the main the issue is the preference behind the construct. Yeah. So you may not be racist overtly, but your preference for my ethnic expression and yours tells me what you're interested in. And so if you choose to not have my expression in your space, you are prejudiced. So when white churches choose to not have black expression in their spaces, but claim diversity, right. that is racist. Yeah. Because when you diminish us down to our talent, our abilities, and say that what we do it's too showy and bringing too much of, of us into the music. Now, and these are just direct claims that I've heard because I've, I've worked in some white churches and with some white churches. Um, sure. When you look at the fact that they would prefer you come to be a part of their expression in the United States rather than them coming to be a part of yours or coming and fetishizing your experience because they enjoy it, but you can't necessarily bring them to the presence of God, that is because they can't receive your ethnic expression. Huh. We as black people, we have this thing in us that tells us white ice must be colder. Yep. And so if white people are doing it, that means that our version of it must be inauthentic. And I've heard this, I just want to get to the heart of God. And oh, the experiences just so different yeah it's different it's ethereal it's esoteric it's natural it's humanistic to be honest for every how great is our god there is a the heavens are telling of god and his glory okay for every oceans there's a i need the o you see what i'm saying it's mm -hmm. just a matter of preference and the construct that says that our preference and the way that we do it naturally we can't get away from black expression. The way we do it naturally ain't good enough in certain churches. Yeah, those people can worship God and be racist. But guess what? Racism is a sin, and he came to redeem them also. They don't have to be perfect to worship. Right. Is it irritating? Yeah. But they don't have to be perfect to worship. Wow. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put a caveat in here for Devon and JP. Um, so with that being said, from both Alphaeus and Pastor Zoe, are we guilty as the black church of making their expression more, uh, or higher or more, uh, preferential than our expression? Absolutely. It's a situation of self-hate. And we have been social. Um, throughout the ages and brutalized and traumatized into thinking that we aren't good enough and what we offer needs to be purified. It's the extension of the curse of Ham, where people said, you know, because he was darker skinned, that he was not 
uh, appropriate, you know, and that his descendants uh, were also uh, then corrupted because of who they are. And so we have been fighting uh, for years for our expression musically, uh, preaching, intellectually, um, to be accepted and promoted. And rather than continuing in the spirit of our ancestors to fight against white supremacy and hegemonic constructs, we would rather assimilate and not just assimilate, because assimilation is not always bad, but syncretize to the point where we lose the full essence of who we are. And it is very interesting, even when we look at I'll just use this as an example. When we look at the Negro spirituals, and for those of us who have been to school um, for music, we understand that the presentation of Deep River and the presentation of Go Down Moses has been placed in this Eurocentric idiom, right? That does not in any way mirror the sound of the plantation. We get closer to the sound of the plantation when we get to the low country in South Carolina, when we get to the Gullah and to the Geechee, and when we get to certain spaces and yes, sir. Yes, sir. that bring us back to the spirit right. of our right. African ancestry. And, you know, in so doing, we look at Thomas Dorsey and his, his evolution and how blues and jazz evolved into this beautiful, thing called gospel music that now in many places there are arguments within this afrocentric community of gospel musicians as to who is authentic who is appropriate who is right who who will last who will have longevity and and we don't even realize that that's exactly what the oppressor right okay right. The, the, the lighter skin oppressor has wanted us to do. And we, we've even seen it in scripture. Let's get them to the point where they fight against these, uh, each other to the point where they don't realize what they're doing to us, to the point that, where they don't even realize that when they're playing, when we're playing, their, we're the ones that are playing their songs on the radio. We own the radio stations that play their music. And let's get them arguing over the music so they don't even realize that they don't even own, that, that they, re they still don't own anything. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I... I really, uh, this, this whole CCM, the same way that gospel is not a movement, CCM is not a movement. And in order for, uh, you know, we do not have to deny the worth of someone else in order to affirm ourselves. So, you know, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with CCM, but, you know, let's respect the authentic sound of blackness. Yes. And it yes. does had a sound. And the same way that CCM could be considered the sound of heaven, so could also be all the rest of the that, that, that is also the, the sound of heaven. But part of it is this, and I'll say this, and, and I'll let it go, is that we want to separate ourselves from the pain of our experience. Mm. And when you listen to CCM, you don't hear the pain in the music. When you listen to gospel, you will always hear the authenticity of our trauma because we are still living the trauma out in 2020, 401 years later after we've been on these shores. But I'm not going to turn it into a um, pepper. <laughs> Good way. What say you? I, I love that you balance this with um, talking about Gullah Geechee and Charleston and the red expression because um, not only and I, I'm even guilty of it. I'm not even talking the way I actually talk because I am Geechee. You know, that's not, this is not how I naturally talk. I've learned to adjust. And I got tired of people saying, you know, why do you sound like that? And so I think even with that idea is what um, we have done uh, in music as it pertains to our sound and our culture. Uh, we, we would rather adjust. Um, I even see where um, this is even church curriculum now. It's church curriculum to say, hey, we're going to take a little shouting out. 
We're going to take all of this other stuff out. We're going to make it a little shorter. We're going we're gonna to do all of this because no, it's, we got to make it more palatable because basically our experience and our culture and what we believe, what we feel, how we express ourselves is not palatable. And the truth is that the congregation, the pews really only see authenticity. They don't, they, they don't really see, you know, they don't know you, they don't understand notes and they, they're not worrying about, you know, the core progressions, but I, honestly, what they respect is authenticity. And, and we have literally pulled ourselves away from who we are to be more palatable in who we are not. Um, now to bring balance to this, I grew up kind of in the street, you know, I, as many of you know my dad, but I was raised by my stepdad. And so we weren't in church, um, maybe a little bit here and there, and then a little bit more towards 2000, but I kind of grew up, um, you know, I was raised by the people around in my neighborhood. Um, and even when my dad, my stepdad uh, came to know Jesus, he decided that he didn't like how gospel sounded. You know, all he knew was Project Patton and Three Six Mafia. Y'all say, I don't know who that is. But anyway, I'm playing. Um, three six mafia, you know. So he he didn't want to hear gospel. He decided that he would. So I was listening to CCM, what we call CCM, um, Hill Song, all of that stuff. Uh, all of that stuff in 1998. He would put a radio in front of me in my brother's room and put a Bible on top and play that. And that's the music that I heard first before I really heard all of the other stuff. And so to say that my experience is only. Um, uh, Thomas Whitfield, it, I would just be lying. Now, the, most of the people around me, that is the truth, but that wasn't my experience. My experience was first hearing Darlene Shazek, I probably messed up her name, but that was my experience, you know? And so I think that I think that sometimes we just kind of put an experience on people that they didn't really receive. But even going back to the culture thing, um, it, it's sad that if you go to Charleston, you'll hear um, what we, I don't know if any of you know Jarrell Smalls. Um, he's a quartet, a quartet guy, but really what Jarrell Smalls does is not necessarily quartet. It's more so we call it like country or Geechee. You know what I mean? We clap like this, you know? And if you go, if you go to Charleston, you'll hear that expression in Charleston, like Pastor Gee said, but you won't hear that anywhere else. Right. Like it's not palatable, it's not received, it's laughed at, it's mm -hmm. like weird, you know? And, and that is, that is the, the example for what has literally happened to us as a culture. Yes, sir. Well, speaking of Charleston, so true story. On the flyer, y'all notice, uh, and I'm, I'm talking from a graphic designer for two seconds, there was a little bit of a hole when you looked at the line for Levites. And I I, I did that uh, on purpose, but not on purpose. There was somebody that I really wanted on this live before I. he was the first invite that I sent. Oh, Lord. And, uh, I didn't get a chance to reach out to him, but guess what? Oh, we goodness. have the Pastor Lamar Simmons oh, on God. this <laughs> live. Yo, I did not know that. You you reached out to me? I did. It's probably my fault. Emails got mixed up. We'll talk offline. But I do. Dude, my bad. So seriously, I most definitely would have done it, especially because that's the only way I could see John McGee, one of my my nephew and my nephew Elisha. That's the only way I could see them. <laughs> so, but we, I, I would have done that. We thank you for hopping on, man. This this is a legend, bar none. Like I I love yeah. Pastor Lamar Simmons. Listen, we were, here. <laughs> we were in college. Like we would drive two and a half, three hours to Tallahassee just to be in a service with Pastor Lamar, and I I am deeply honored to have you here. But the subject at hand, can you sing a song or the song of the Lord and be racist? Absolutely. Absolutely. I am dealing with uh, not becoming a racist again right now. Um, <laughs> I got delivered from uh, perpetual or responsive racism uh, after I realized that I was whitewashed for years as I voted as a Republican. Uh, off of one moral issue, abortion. Uh, but I did not realize what they did to uh, minorities and how their policies did not actually fit people or God for that matter. Uh, so yes, I absolutely believe it. Uh, I believe racism has to be dealt with on both ends though. Uh, yeah. Just because you are an oppressed, an oppressed black person, if you are a saved black person, 
you have to oppress racism in you, even though you receive it. And most of us feel entitled to be racist. And it, until we deal with what's in our heart, we will not reconcile the church together because the ministry of reconciliation is what God is calling us to. And there is no reconciliation without conciliation. That's peace building, peacemaking, and propitiation, atonement, at one minute, true repentance, true reconstruction. So yes, absolutely. And the saddest part is most white people uh, that love God, they're so sincere in their love for God, but they're still white. So they have not evolved. We have been waiting for white people to evolve for centuries and they just have not evolved as complete humans. They're not aware of how brutal their past is, how brutal their current uh, actions are. They just live in a bubble. And uh, most of them don't even know they're racist. And and technically their worship is not, but their recollection of history is, their hermeneutics, their theology is racist. So thus it makes them racist. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. So so I'm, I'm gonna keep it with you, Pastor Lamar. So how- and Let me just say, Pastor A. Barry, I don't know. I don't I think I know you, the screen's so small, but you are something else. <laughs> you are somebody something else. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> yeah. he, he, it's like he's from Charleston because he, he talks that trash like how we talk. For real. For real. For real. For real. For real. For real. So Pastor Lamar, how do we how do we undo this bad practice? And when I say we, the black church, like what is our first step? Our first step is one, we must uh, the black church has been embracing something. And I do hate using the two terms, but there are there are two existing churches. We're going to have to fix it. We're going to have to fix it because I could go all into Azusa and how we messed it up, that God wants to use the church to actually fix the race problem. Uh, but we're going to have to embrace our style of who we are as a culture and learn to merge other, other things with ours, but not divorce who we are to embrace another style. I barely listen to American music, period. Uh, I'm just, I love, tra I travel the world musically. So there will be times I'm listening to all African music. There'll be times I'm listening to all Swedish music, half the stuff, I don't know. They could be worse for the devil, but it sounds good, so I listen to it. Uh, but no, I do. I do make sure. It's not right. But but we have been the black church one. We've lost a lot of our black men one because we are still teaching the Bible from the color of the page and not the color of the letters. Wow. See, the page is white, but the letters are black for a reason. That's right. <laughs> because the Bible is black. The people in it are black. The whole That's thing right. happened in Africa. OK. Uh, the, so, whole thing. Uh, the burning bush was an African burning bush. You understand? All the, the the black people are not the lost tribes of Israel. We were in every tribe. Even if Moses was a lighter skin, he had a dark skin wife. All of the tribe leaders had wives that were black. It's unbelievable how we've been whitewashed out. And so wow. if we can get back to uh Undoing our minds in the black church. Undoing our minds from American history and what racism taught. Remember, racism was invented by Christianity in, in America. Yes, sir. This stuff was preached from the pulpits. So yeah. we have to undo it. But listen, why would we abandon it? And I'll just get back to because I'm, I'm a historian when it comes to this stuff, but I'll get to what. Uh, McGee was talking about and as far as the CCM and the gospel thing and how we leave that whole thing. I have mourned gospel music. Whatever CCM is, what they call impromptu now, I call it the song of the Lord. I've been doing it since I've been 10. That's all I've known. Years. Yes, sir. That's all I know. True story. <laughs> all I knew is I could not sing, stop singing hallelujah at Mount Sinai Holiness Church and my granddad said, I don't know what he's doing, but let's go with it. <laughs> you know, and that so that, that's always been a part of us, but they embrace it and call it something else. And now the black church looks at them as if they they introduce something into the world. 
that we've always been doing. Uh, then there is uh, the CCM concept on the uh, the light vocals, uh, starting with uh, the unison and then breaking into the harmonies and then breaking into uh, the band. If I'm I'm going to slip my wrist if I I if I hear another good gospel singer, good gospel group, just all their songs sound like that. I just I can't take it. I don't understand how they have closed their ears to hmm. all the channels heaven has. And you only hear what mimics, catch this, the group of people that have socially re-engineered you to be enamored with their style. And they have, they have literally torn down gospel music we have through what is truly called mental ethnic cleansing. Wow. We wow. think our way is old, wrong, when the truth is, if you add the prophetic to a hymn and really switch that thing around and tap into a whole other, we could go somewhere tribal on this that the world wouldn't be able to handle. But mm -hmm. we we just feel we have to be what, oh ye, great white is right. That's, that's our mind, mentality, basically. Wow. Don't go anywhere, Pastor Lamar. Please do not go anywhere. You say I'm in the bed, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna turn this time one more time, y'all. We got about 15 good minutes that we, we gotta like try to get as much as we can. Listen, I, I said this before, I, I did a part two because part one got real, real good. Part two is getting real, real good. Listen, I guess I'm gonna have to do a part three, but here we go. Next question. In a virtual world, the necessity of long and lofty praise and worship moments or choir selections have taken a back seat. What do you suggest music ministries do to make sure no matter how long they are given to minister, it is precise and effective? Huh. Anybody? I'll go. <laughs> so, so I think that precision and effectivity is relative to the culture of the house. And so for for me, when when you read that question, I immediately heard submission to the leader's request, because that has to do, in my opinion, with order and right. the order is set. And if he's wrong, God is going to deal with him. But to me, if we're going to condense what is happening in a virtual world, then whoever our um overhead is whoever we're submitted to whoever is uh steering this ship specifically um that sounds to me like submission to what he says even if i don't like me um i don't like to put time limits on worship i don't like to put time limits on preaching because for me if we'll sit for three hours to watch avengers end game <laughs> but we'll sit in a one hour service and be grabbing our purses and our Bibles ready to run to the parking lot after one hour service. That tells me that there's a difference in what we consider to be worth our time. And the movies cost a cover charge, okay? And so what I think is um, that sounds to me like submission. Even if a menstrual don't like it, I think that God blesses it and God anoints it when you submit to the request that has been to place and the demand that is placed on you. I'll go, I'll go a little bit further and say this. If you give me 20 seconds. The only thing I'll say is you find out, and all the preachers on here will, will, will uh, concur, I'm sure. You find out how good of a preacher you really are if you can strike fire in 20 minutes. And so a leader puts a demand on you. It does not. Uh, cause you to dilute what you're doing. But if the leader puts a demand on you to do it in 15 minutes, that is not dilution. That's creating a concentrate. And concentrate can be stronger than when you add water. Right. And so it puts a demand on your gifting to light fire and sit down and to be effective. <laughs> Yes. So that that's my my view on that. But go ahead, brother. I, I want to jump in and talk about this whole notion of effective. 
um, because I think that many of us have been poisoned, and I want to use that word very intentionally, poisoned by this inappropriate interpretation of the reaction or response of an audience to determine whether or not a moment has taken yeah. root. And so we look for reaction as opposed to trusting God for response. And so I different, I, I differ a bit from, from pastor in that I truly believe that it does not have to be everlasting to be eternal. And, you know, most of us at this point have what is identified by psychologists as screen fatigue. And when it comes to screen fatigue, none of us want to be sitting in front of a screen really at this point in the world, you know, particularly the computer screen, iPad, iPhone, something that's small um, for more than an hour, hour and a half to truly engage. And even when we do, we're not undistracted. And so the reality of the matter is, is that we have to adapt ourselves in this environment, as Pastor would say, to strike fire quick, to get, you know, to get, you know, not to get to the point, but to start with the point. And that's very difficult for some preachers to do because we like to take the long way around homiletically to say something that we probably could have said in about 30 minutes less than it took. You know, our introductions sometimes are sermons to themselves. And so I had to realize, all right, what is the bite-sized nugget that people are going to leave this computer screen with to the next time they encounter me? And then to not feel pressured to put everything into this Sunday worship experience, because now that we're in a virtual space, I have to carry this message over across the contour of this week. So, you know, when it comes to music ministry, you know, and, we, and, and effectiveness, it is what is the message we're trying to get across? How can we best get this across musically? Is it going to be pre-production? Is it going to be live? Because some people need to pre-record. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we, need, we need a little bit more control over that. <laughs> people who can go live. Hey, man. You know, and, and so these are the things that, that we have to consider. And we're not in this season where you can just grab the mic and do what we used to call going for broke. We're just not there right <laughs> <laughs> if I could just to chime in, uh, I believe every single one of you was right. However, I will say this that I have learned. Only Western Christianity even has the discussion of how long worship and preaching is. Let's make it very clear. Only American Church, the actual country that was responsible for the almost the entire population of spirit filled people now that start the Azusa revival was on American soil. We're the only ones that actually are managing how much time is for worship and how much time is for preaching. And I think that is the problem more than the others, but what each pastor is saying is the absolute solution for the mindset we're dealing with. Absolutely. You know, and 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 uncle, unc dad, as I call you, you're absolutely, I'm probably Afrocentric in every other way, except when it comes to long church. And, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> I've preached in Africa. I've been to Africa several times and it is true. They, they take their time getting there. Yep. You're not going to start till an hour and a half after they say it's supposed to start. Mm -hmm. And then once it starts, it's going to be two hours before you get up to preach. <laughs> and you're going to preach. They want you to preach for an hour. And then they want you to go into healing signs and wonders for another however long that lasts. Mm -hmm. And they want you to do that 10 nights in a row. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so you leave there ready to get back to America. <laughs> it, it, it makes two it makes two hours go by real fast but that that's a that's a very true reality is that we probably have gotten quite distant from our african roots when it re relates to the engaging in spiritual space because for them it was this whole conjuring even of altered states of consciousness and most of them aren't even in 
we, we don't labor that long before the Lord to even get yeah. to that. But even other nationalities, other spiritual nationalities, you go to Brazil, uh, you go to other, you know, they kind of really, if it's a spirit field, if, it, if they've yeah. been, it's a liturgical religious church, they're going to do it the way Americans or Europeans taught them to do it. But they, they actually approach worship with going into the presence, not coming into a place for a tour. Let me get this, this, this done and out so I can get back on with my life. Uh, what I think more of uh, the church in America has more become like the Tower of Babel. We're going to build something to tell God where to meet us and how to meet us. Wow. And that's what I think uh, is more deadly to me. Uh, wow. That. I don't know what has God said, like, yo, y'all need to really cut cut worship down, cut service down. It's just like what people want. That's what we're doing. So yeah. wow. that's I'm what gonna, makes me nervous. I'm going to come on the other side of this only because I'm not a senior pastor. And so I want to talk to the ones who are serving senior pastors. Um, and I, I, I'm probably lying. I'll probably talk about the time thing in a little bit. But um, I do want to talk to the dishonorable. I, I just believe that I'm called to the dishonorable. Um, as we're talking about precision and effectiveness, I don't think that you could you get to decide how you can be more precise um, in this honor. If somebody gives you, if your pastor, your leader gives you a time, you don't get to like just do whatever you want. And 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 and, and even though I, I believe that we can worship in racism and in a whole bunch of other issues and problems that some of us deal with, struggle with, um, I'm just not sure how effective we can be in this honor. And like, and even as things are gestating in you and things are moving in you and you're matriculating and coming into who you're going to be, I don't think that you get to start making decisions as a worship leader, as a musician on how long things should be because your pastor decides that he only wants to give you 10 minutes. If he gives you 10 minutes, do 10 minutes. Like, I, I just don't, I don't, I, me personally, I just don't see why that's so hard to just do what leadership tells you. And I, and I believe that it's a, a, a conversation of devotion also. Because in some cases, and I'll, you can get me later, in some cases, I see where um, the worship leader sings a song and the verse, the intro is cool, the verse is cool, the other the next verse is cool, bridge is cool, and vamp, we have to like almost conjure up and get ourselves to a certain place that we can actually even start kind of being effective in ad libs and even in uh, precision. Um, sometimes because of a lack of devotion. And Absolutely. so where I see people more often not like needing a whole lot of time to get to a place where they should have been there already before before um, approaching the song or service or worship moment or whatever it is, um, I see, especially with my generation, just a real lack of devotion to where you need time to actually finally get somewhere 12 minutes into the song. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's how I feel. As far as far as time, I, I, don't, I don't like short service. <laughs> I don't, I don't like, if they stop smoking all that cigarette on Saturday night, <laughs> you know, I'm not on <laughs> now I'm not with long ineffective services, <laughs> long nonsense, long foolishness. I'm not with that. So I I do I am with uh, Pastor McGee on that. But I mean, just the you know the restraint, and you know I'm from Charleston. I don't. Know. Yeah, <laughs> Alpheus. Yeah, I, you know, I'll, always. I, I just think we got to consider when we're programming in church. Just consider the next generation. I mean, they're gonna check out, and 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 everything that's on our heart for our people. Um, I mean, if we don't if we don't catch them below the shoulders, it is gonna every generation. Um, what the things of God is not gonna be preserved, and yeah. and so you know. If it's on your heart to, to do this, X, Y, Z, um, are we teaching this? Are we teaching the commandments of God? Or, I mean, what are we teaching in Sunday school? And then even in this virtual world, I mean, if it ain't hot, if it ain't quality, um, they're used to their cell phones. I mean, we're, we're not competing with Disney, but but obviously if the audio is not right, if the, if the, if the, the colors... Yeah. If, I mean, they are checking out now. That's you know, you can you can say what you want, but if it's is not, it it's the truth. I mean, my students, they will check out on me. You know, if and so I just think we gotta we gotta consider that. And I want to teach I want to teach these kids 
the synoptic gospels and, and what an allegory is, but man, I gotta I gotta get through all of this and just to teach them the first five books of the Bible. And and I have to consider that. I have to, I always say when I train, I entertain. And when I'm entertaining, I have to make sure I am training. So I made up this word, intertrain. So I think <laughs> if we if we do that, we will be effective with the next generation. I'm gonna use that and word. You know, this is a made up word. Hashtag in the train. In the train. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, yeah, man. This this is great. I have one final question of the night, and I promise I'm gonna let y'all go. This has been been uh beyond anything that I could even plan or or imagine. My last question of the night going forward. How do we keep from introducing biblically empty songs that perpetuate an unrealistic theology for the sake of a song selection? Sunday school. <laughs> say, Absolutely. No. <laughs> read, yeah. the read the Bible. Like read it for yourself and read it if, if to, to pull us all together. Read it um, not as a Western book. You know, read it not on, only in a spiritual understanding, but also in an African understanding and the fullness Absolutely. of who you are in, in your in your cultural leaning and allow the Numa, allow the Holy Spirit to breathe because the Holy Spirit being the spirit of truth will never lead you to write a song that is inerrant or that is incongruent with the witness of the Holy Scripture oh. from Genesis to Revelation. Oh. So most of the most of the persons who write incongruent songs i won't call them gospel songs i'll call them you know incongruent songs or ditties even the ones that are on radio that we like they did that because they wanted to entertain but to borrow from Alpheus, they've not been properly entertained mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> let let the book. let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 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 as you teach and admonish one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then for actual application, if it's a minister of music or a worship leader that is picking songs, everything that's great for radio, everything that sounds great, is not one spiritual in its context. And it is not to fit your the spiritual context of your church service. But then there's a deeper spiritual context that many of the songs that are in the gospel industry were written and sung through vessels that actually despise the church. Wow. So there is this disconnect because you're trying to put this thing in the church when the truth is. And they would, and many of us know. We talk to them you know, on many different bases. They can't stand what we do. They don't even want to come to church. They come to church to get a check when they got to, but they don't want to have nothing. They think we are just off and out of it. And and I, I mean, I'm not even friends with most of them anymore because I just can't take the offense anymore and act like I love you. Because uh, an enemy of my God is an enemy of me now, you know. Right. But. The truth is that deeper spiritual is that some of this stuff is not it didn't come from a spiritual place. But if more churches and more more uh, ministers of music would take the time to do what you all are doing tonight, you would help train people to be able to hear and, uh, you know, be more spiritual, come from the scriptures. But also we can we can raise writers. Uh, if you got a good pastor that's preaching, it should be at least 10, 20 songs coming out of good sermons. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. And we don't get no royalties. That's a whole nother class we need to have. I don't get no money. But, <laughs> I, I, you know, it, it's it's there to be done. But that there's that part, too. I, yes. I wanted to, uh, to just really quickly add something to that, uh, Bishop, that you just brought to my mind in that statement from the Clark Sisters movie, which was Twinkie walking around with her Bible. Yep. 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 In prayer, you know, Lord, give me some. And, and one of the most sophisticated and advanced musical minds of her time as well, yep. walking around with her Bible, praying for revelation for, for the spirit of and 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 have you know? Come on, you brought the sunshine. And and again, and so this is not about style. 
because that was crossover. Right. But it was still centered in the biblical witness. You know, mm -hmm. I think of persons like Dr. Judy McAllister and other persons who are just iconic figures in, in gospel and in praise and worship that have a commitment. Bishop Lamar Simmons, since he's on here with us, that have a commitment to God and to the word of God, but also to good music. Yeah, you right. can have it all mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you're, if there's a commitment. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. Yeah, uh, I think one of the comments was, can we give an example of one of those songs? You know, you, you in the spirit, Reverend. <laughs> Go now, let me uh, say and, this. You know. I, I, I'm, I'm a Kojic boy from the west side of Chicago. That's where my snappiness come from and my lack of politeness or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> but I pastor a church in the backwoods, not the front, the back. Okay? And so there are plenty of songs to where uh, my choir will bring it out and uh, it ain't spiritual. For example, that, uh, oh, I hate this one. Lord, don't move a mountain, but give me the strength to climb. <laughs> Why are you wasting our time with this? <laughs> and they sing it with fiber and love. I mean, they sing it with fervor, and it is biblically incongruent. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, and the and these our churches are plagued with music that is incongruent because we are not consecrated as a people. Consecrated. I would argue that those people who write those songs are not sheep. They're goats. Jesus. And that will yes. there will eventually be a separation. I think, unfortunately, that when the Bible says that there's going to be a separation of the wheat and the tear, that God is going to do the separation, unfortunately, some of the people and some of the churches that we like are tares. The reality is they are tares. And we can't be so dedicated to... Um, to our the, the personality we can't be so dedicated to um their career and their success and wanting to see them win that we allow ourselves to indulge in things that are in direct contradiction to the biblical context that we claim to be following you can't walk yeah. circumspectly with the word of god and sing music and point it towards god that ain't talking about him so I said, I think I talked about it uh, last time we did a live, Maurice. We we throw God a party, but we invite all of our friends. We put our name on the cake and we play the music we want to hear. And then tell God, this is a party for you. Right. If you sing with songs that ain't in congruence with God's word, you sing in a lie. Wow. You are. And, 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 le and let me just quickly, because obvious hit it. And we laugh, but I need us to go back and see the the damaging implications of a disappearing Christian education element of right. the local church. Yeah, is that sure? You know, most of us have the privilege of Sunday school and YPWW and BTU and all of those things that developed within us, whether we were aware of it or not. This. Yeah this foundation and now we have a generation of persons who don't have a, my superintendent growing up with sister barbara johnson we don't have barbara johnson's anymore doc i had a barbara jones yeah and <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't have no obvious <laughs> and we're and so now what people have to do is they have to a, approach their songwriting from what they listen to someone else write Mm -hmm. and they don't have a standard or a metric whereby which to grade its correctness because of the fact that Christian education and discipleship by and large is no longer an emphasized element within the African-American church experience. And and I will say this too, that it is the, the education piece is so important because the further back we go in the timeline, it may not match scripture, 
but it was the best way the writer could explain their experience. And so there are times when we just, it makes us cringe because of what we, what we know how our hermeneutics and theology connect. But if you could just put yourself in, you know, 1865, <laughs> that, you know, they are picking cotton and they tie, <laughs> you know, but they, all they had was their faith, but it was illegal for them to read the scriptures. They didn't know how to. So a lot of, a lot of that does not, does not match it. So I just, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, but it also, education is the key to understand certain songs are out of, but songs that are birthed in this time, the yeah. ones we talk about this time, some of them are, are just straight up craziness. Now I will say this: I love CCM, certain CCM songs, but songs, certain certain worship songs, they don't just the lyrics might be scriptural, but there is a mood in the song that has a depression tone in it. Yep, it has a dark tone to it. Whether yeah. you uh, whether you submit to hurts and all of that that technology, some of this stuff it is so depressing. I don't know, but every time I hear I give myself away sing, sang by certain people, I get depressed. And I, I, I actually like the song. One, oh, I don't understand why it takes so long to give yourself away, because everybody sing that song for 30 minutes. But <laughs> oh my God. I'm just saying. Um, you know, I'm, I'll stop right there. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't mean to stop you, <laughs> I didn't mean. I was about to say something. I didn't. Mean, I didn't mean to stop you. If I did, uh, no, no, you didn't. I just, I just felt okay. like I was getting out of line. <laughs> uh, I agree. I agree with the mood thing. I feel like somebody said that um, that gospel kind of connected us to our pain, right? Sometimes um, the opposite. We'll call it CPU. Sometimes uh, we get to ignore and leave things unconfronted. To just talk about the mysteries and the wonders of Jesus, and like you know, we well, I've been in, I've been in writing sessions. We literally try to find the most uh, abstract word to use, you know, just so we can get away from what seems mundane or whatever, whatever that's whatever that is. Um, and so sometimes, uh, because we are disconnected from our pain, uh, making the newer style of music, um, I believe that we leave so many things unconfronted. And we and we sing about Jesus, but you can still hear what we haven't confronted. You can still hear what we have not processed. The parts of us that are un left unprocessed, the parts of us that are just rebellious, that is honorable. I mean, it, it's 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 a thing in my generation. What else is a thing that's sad is the fact that we even have to say the song of the Lord, and as mm -hmm. a category of what we do. This, if we're not doing the song of the Lord, what are we doing? Like, like, if it's not the song of the Lord, if it's not, if it's not uh, a download, what is it? Um, I, I, I've been in more, I'm a producer, and so I've been in more situations making music, putting together an album with people who have no mandate, no real download, no real direction on why they are doing this. It is literally birthed out of, I wasn't somebody in the lunch line. And so now I get a stage and I get a mic and I get to show everybody what I can do. And I need you to produce this. Well, what is Jesus saying about this? Well, I don't really know, but just give me a song. Just let's just let's just put something together. No prayer, no supplication, no fasting. Maybe I'm old, so I know how to change and I'm you know, whatever. But I mean, I, I just I just don't see how this is I'm telling y'all, this is done so far from prayer. And fasting and consecration and uh, uh, a devotion, like literally, almost everything you hear, and I, they can be mad at me. I don't care. Everything you hear on the radio is 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 all business. It's all stuff. People come together and they just decide, I'm going to put this on together. Let's come together. Let's grab two people. They ain't devoted, but we're going to put them together and we're going to just make up words. And you play six, four, five, one. That's the literally the core progression of every song on the radio. You you play that, we're gonna come together, we just gonna write something. And 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 all of us are unconfronted. That's why you hear what you hear in the moods and stuff like that. But then also none of it is about Jesus. It's it's the words. Here I am, I'm standing at the door and I knock. <laughs> you know what I mean? The problem is that we're having parties and he's on the other side of the door. Like with all of these songs, all of the all of this stuff that we're doing. Um, you know, uh 
uh, uh, you a big Amos Five guy. You know, uh, I think that's is it isn't it Amos Five um, having all of these. You know, um, you can say you can say it better than I can. I can't remember it verbatim, but it's just a lot of nonsense that we're doing. And, Hypocrite and I, church. Yeah, and and we've moved um, the conversation in the more modern music arenas is that's wrong and that was wrong and they did this wrong and they did that wrong and they did that unlearned and so we have to come over here and do it this way and they have really just went to the other extreme of this and formed such a hatred for um for what they believed uh, uh was wrong or an error and we're just on the other side my generation is just on the other side and and we know a little more got a little bit more education we're using the right words but our intentions are so far from the holy spirit and things of god and uh, is this the truth man it's it's all nonsense it's wow. nonsense yeah. i'm i'm going to tell y'all something as we as we wrap up um it's it's a blessing to be have been raised and born where i was in the state of florida no no shade to any other state because we had such a culture in gospel music that we were afraid to especially me to write a song and I go sing at love and faith and that song not be biblic biblically sound because <laughs> love and faith has a pastor that will literally call you out like he may let you get through the song but after you're yeah. over okay now let me talk to you <laughs> and and so that's the culture I come from what you say for, uh, I can't even hear you <laughs> I feel like y'all not making me sound good but I get it <laughs> But seriously, seriously, you know, and not just Pastor uh, Bishop Lamar, but uh, Dr. John Guns, like Bishop Derek Triplett, uh, let's go Baptist, uh, uh, Macedonia in Eatonville, Florida. Like you were afraid to go in these churches and literally sing a unrealistic theology. And I agree with all of you. The, the miseducation of Christianity is a problem for us right now, especially those of us who are creatives who write songs, because as Devon alluded to it, you know, everything that's on top five radio, I, I'm sorry, like, I don't, to be honest with y'all, I don't listen to gospel music all day long. I just can't. Because at some point, it's going to either annoy me or it's going to make me mad. And so, you know, I have to have a, a, a little bit of a balance because there's so much miseducation going on uh, when it comes to gospel music. Not at large, but in part. Uh, and so we have to really, really change that. Now, listen, I, I could go on, y'all. This We got to do more. Um, I, you know, somebody asked me last night, is there a way that we can do this uh, on a larger scale when corona is no longer a problem? And the answer is yes. I ain't talked to nobody on this panel, but I, if I got to put myself out there, we're literally going to make that happen because I, I promise you, if we manage uh, our season, especially this next season, well, I believe we will see a, a massive harvest of souls uh, to the kingdom. But I want to do one more thing. Uh, and I want Alpheus to talk about something big that he has coming up. Uh, yes, Sunday yeah. school. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We are doing what, what is it here? Oh, yeah. Uh, vacation Bible school. <laughs> and so yeah. in, in this pandemic, so the churches that we're serving in, in this region, they get our curriculum. Um, but now, you know, they're they're quarantined, so the teachers couldn't teach. So we started children's church online and teen church online. And then of course, everybody's counseling the vacation Bible school, which was is a really huge in our region for, for souls, uh, for so many reasons. But we're doing an online safe vacation Bible school for the Charlotte area. We just completed one in the upstate South Carolina area. So Charlotte, it re this really could be for anybody, but visit vacationbiblescool.online. Register is free. And um, it's, it's changed the world. Have no fear. And um, you see the information there. So that's something coming up. And then we had a back to school online block party. We're giving away free pizza delivery so they can literally get a virtual prize in our session and get a knock on the door and uh, and of course the word of god salvation we're praying worshiping and yes souls can be saved through zoom absolutely yes sir, yes, yes, sir. sir. i love each and every one of y'all i i'm deeply honored that you thought enough of me to come on this platform tonight but i want each of you to do one thing and we're done uh i need each of you to give me a five second five to ten second word of encouragement 
uh, for those that are watching. I'm going to start with uh, my good brother, Alpheus, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, I think this next season will be a happy season for you by what you don't do. Psalm 1 said, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, yada, yada, yada. So what you don't do in this next season will contribute to your happiness. You said five seconds. I'll stop. Good way. Uh, build well. Build well. Um, this is a time where we are being pulled away from our norm, and some of us are starting to get back into it. But I think that while you are in a, a place where you might be trying to figure out what to do next, um, I think that you should really seek and find in yourself what God is, uh, wants to pull out of you that might be a little uncomfortable. It might not be what you're used to and find out the way to build it. Don't be afraid. Put the structure to it. Put the system to it and build well. You have something inside of you. So build it. Pastor Zoe. Um, The level of power that an individual operates in is directly tied to and based upon the amount of time spent with God. If you want more power in your life, then this is the perfect time for you to consecrate so that whenever and whatever platform you step onto, we see an unleashing of the power of God, regardless of how short the service is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a JP. Move the barriers, mind your business, and make a difference. My God. Is that it? <laughs> and last but not least, uh, our big uncle, our chief apostle for the night, uh, Bishop <laughs> Mark Simmons. Listen, uh, again, thank you for letting me come on. I literally just woke up and I tuned on this, so I still don't know how I'm even on this. But uh, thank you. Listen, there are people whose lives have been turned upside down. There are people that are going to their homes and their entire family, everybody that lived in every other room is dead. You are going through, but you are not through going. If you remain, keep both hands, use both hands to hold on to whatever God told you, because by the end of this, as he is shaking up our world, I promise you, God's outcome is going to outperform the crisis. Wow. But you must make it to the outcome. Wow. 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 Uh, again, I love y'all so much. Everybody that's watching, I'm trying to manage two different screens. So I see some of you on one screen over here and some of you are on the screen here. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for watching. Tomorrow night, I need you to call every parent, uh, every student, whether K through 12, college. We are having a very important discussion tomorrow night about the future of our educational system. And I have a very powerful panel of black educators from all different parts of the country uh, and we're going to be coming together. So please make sure that you are on. I love each and every one of you all. Have a safe night. And we will see you when we see you guys. Hang tight. Love you all. Good night.